systematic theology this is lesson 13 part 1 the Bible doctrine of faith the Bible doctrine of faith as we have seen already in previous lessons faith is essential for salvation faith is also essential for our service to God as well faith is so important that without it we are told in Hebrews 11 and verse 6 that it is impossible to please God in other passages in the Bible we find that we are to live by faith in this lesson we'll examine what the Bible says about faith we will see that there is saving faith operating faith and faith as being the system of doctrines that we believe now please let me reiterate it is essential that we understand what faith is and is not it's also very essential that we understand the difference between saving faith operating faith and faith as being a system of doctrines that we believe otherwise we can and will misunderstand what the bible is saying so toward that end let us examine what the bible says about faith so question number one which comes first repentance or faith our text is found in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 32 for John came unto you in the way of righteousness and ye believed him not but the publicans and the harlots believed him and ye when ye had seen it repented not afterward that you might believe him Mark chapter 1 and verse 15 and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel Acts chapter 20 and verse 21 testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ just merely to believe in the existence of God is not what is meant by faith to believe in a man's existence is one thing and to believe in that man is altogether another thing we believe in the existence of men and institutions we have no faith in so Bible belief or faith means trust dependence confidence reliance to believe in Jesus Christ is to trust him to save depend upon him for salvation nobody can reasonably trust Jesus to save him or depend on Jesus for salvation until he has repented from dead works that's according to Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 that is given up the idea of saving himself by works and that's where the faith comes in Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and uh, faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment so hence repentance necessarily logically and scripturally comes before faith everywhere in the Bible where repentance and faith are mentioned together repentance is put first so question number two can any repent until after he believes in God's existence 
Our passage of scripture is Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, according to our scripture reference, it would not be possible for any individual to repent if a belief in God or Jesus is not held. In other words, an atheist would not be able to repent simply because they don't believe in God or Jesus. They wouldn't see any reason for repentance since there's no doing of anything wrong. If there's no higher being to hold mankind in account, then what use is repentance? And, as we well know, without the work of the Holy Spirit, there is no repentance. Question number three. Does a mere belief in the existence of God bring salvation? Well, a very clear passage to answer this question is found in James chapter 2 and verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, and thou doest well. <laughs> but then James sort of twists the knife, I suppose you could say. The devils also believe and tremble. So James is saying here, you really think that that's really, really good? Well, yeah, okay, but just understand that the demons, well, they also believe that God exists, but they tremble too. They are very much aware of the existence of God. Now, I want you to note the fact that nothing short of a faith that produces obedience will bring salvation. The demons believe in God, but of course that does not save them because there is no salvation for the fallen angels, which the demons are. Therefore, without the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, an individual will not have anything but an intellectual belief in God, and an intellectual belief will not bring salvation. The demons have an intellectual belief, but it doesn't do them any good as far as salvation is concerned. Of course, they can't be saved to begin with, but the reasoning still applies to a human. They can believe in the existence of God, but unless they have the faith, that convicting faith, and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives to convince them that they are lost and, and they need to be saved, then it's not going to do them any good. Question number four. What sort of faith is it that does not produce good works? Our passage is James chapter 2 and verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That's pretty plain, don't you think? We see here that very clearly a universal principle as far as humans are concerned, mankind is concerned, the body without the spirit is dead. The body cannot function without the spirit. The spirit is the actually the living thing of a person. And the soul is the intellect of that, but that's the reason that the spirit is the part that's redeemed. So faith without works is dead also. So if we can understand that the body without the spirit is dead, if we understand that at the point of death, the spirit and the soul leave the body, that body ceases to function. And so we can then understand also that without faith, works is dead also. In other words, works do not do a bit of good. Anything dead is useless. So any work that's without faith is useless. The faith that saves, but not only saves, but produces good works as well, 
Any other kind of faith is what I would call an intellectual faith. It's simply a belief, a system of beliefs, that's all. It is not a faith of action, which is what brings about salvation. It is also a faith of action that results in good works after salvation. We work because we have been saved, not in order to be saved. Question number five. Do good works come in order to save us or because we have been saved? Well, we probably already answered that question, but let's go into a little bit more detail. Our passages are Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Most of us are pretty well aware of what this passage says, but let's do it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Our scripture reference very clearly states that our good works come as a result of salvation because of salvation, not the cause of it. Good works without salvation is just simply that, good works. And these good works mean nothing to the Lord. When we work after salvation, he gets the glory and the honor or at least he should anyway. Any good works done before salvation will only be credited to the individual doing them. It counts nothing with God. And salvation comes to us as a gift. To do anything to obtain it would cause it to cease to be a gift. And to receive a gift all that's needed is to accept it. Nothing is given in return. If anything was given in return for a gift, then it would cease to be a gift, and we would have done something in order to receive it. So then it simply becomes an exchange of goods or exchange of service, however you want to put it but it ceases to be a gift. Giving anything in return causes the gift to cease to be a gift. It is then purchased or gotten in exchange of something of value for it. There is nothing that is possible to be in value to exchange for salvation. Therefore, there is nothing that could be given. Salvation has to be a gift, but that does not mean that it's without cost. There was a great price paid for salvation. The life of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Question number six. Do good works have anything whatever to do with obtaining salvation? Well, our passage comes from Romans chapter four, verses three, four, and five. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Salvation produces an obedient life. But an obedient life never, you get that? Never produces salvation. So thus we have seen very clearly that we have salvation because, number one, God the Father. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us. God the Son. He died and rose again so that we might have the payment for our sins with his death and sacrifice on the cross and provided us eternal life by rising again. God the Holy Spirit 
He convicts and persuades man in the need for salvation. Without him, no one would ever be saved because no one will come to salvation without his power of conviction. There must be a belief in God and Jesus. The individual must have faith that Jesus will save him. The individual must agree with God that he is a sinner and repent and ask Jesus to save him. And then good works should be done. We'll conclude this subject in uh, part number two.